morning, everyone. Welcome on this rainy August Sunday morning. But we're glad you're here. Welcome. Welcome to the God's house. Psalm 136, we read, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. Let's join together now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and give him all the honor and the praise and the glory that's due his name. Let's pray right now. Our dear Father, thank you. Thank you for this day and for gathering us together again here in your house and in your presence to worship you. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the blessings of the past week and for being with us and walking with us in every Thing that we may have been facing. We thank you that in whatever trial, whatever challenge we may be facing, that you continue to, have, to love us with a love that endures forever. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the peace. Thank you for the assurance we have in knowing that we are never alone. You are with us always. We commit this service to you now. We pray that you would speak to us, teach us, help us to hear your voice. Help us to learn what it is you want to teach us by yourself and equip us to carry out the work that you have for each of us to do this week. We pray this all in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the one that's coming again. Amen. Uh, announcements for the week. Uh, there are a couple of inserts in your bulletin. Please uh, make note of those. Uh, one of them is about a concert at the Big E. Skip the one yeah, um, I didn't make enough copies for some of you. Uh, no doubt have a copy of a Phil Wickham uh, concert that's going to be at the Big E. I think it might be the opening night at the Big E on September 13th. Uh, Phil Wickham is a contemporary uh, Christian musician, has some great, great music. We need to do some here in, in the church. Uh, I didn't have enough uh, copies to put in all of the bulletins, but uh, uh, I also emailed out uh, to the people that I at least have emails for. Anybody interested in going, please see me. It would be wonderful to be able to have a group of uh, people from our church go up there. It also includes the entrance in, entrance ticket into the biggie, not just the concert. But uh, uh, if, you, if you didn't get a copy in your, uh, in your bulletin uh, and you're interested, please see me after. The tickets are going pretty fast, so uh, I don't want to hesitate in getting getting tickets. Uh, so just let me know if you're interested, okay? Thank you, Skip. <clears throat> a couple other ones just to, to highlight. Uh, Saturday evening, uh, trivia night here at the church. So uh, join us uh, at 7 o'clock uh, next Saturday night. We'll see who the trivia master is and who, who's going to Jeopardy. Uh, and the other big one, uh, school starts this week, at least for me it does, Thursday. Um, and so uh, it's that time of year we think about our prayer sponsors for our children. And so um, if you'd like to be one, there's a sign-up sheet. And if you're a parent or grandparent, um, there's an information sheet out on the table for you to, to fill out. So please take care of that so we can have that up and running very soon. We bet so everything to talk about this week unless somebody else wants to share something. Not let's run together in a hymn, number 360, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Just one other thing about that, that concert, uh, for those of you who have been to the Big E, that's a pretty big public venue, uh, the Big E. I think it runs for about three weeks or so. And I just think it's wonderful to have a Christian artist at a public event like that. It's just it's really, really cool. So join us the Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Oh, my. 
how much people care about her and leading up to the surgery on the 27th I know this would be an encouragement so please send her a quick card and she'd appreciate that uh, and we also talked about the prayer sponsor program and uh, that is beginning again but this year I think it would be a really good idea to begin to also pray for our teachers and people that work in the schools so we're going to add them onto that list so there's a sign up sheet out in the fellowship hall, you can pray for a student, you can pray for a teacher, you can pray for both, but please sign up. We want to get uh, people prayer covered. School is not the, it's not, it's not what it used to be, right? We need to be covering our students and teachers. Amen. So let's do that together. So as we go to prayer, what can we as a church right now be praying for? Any specific needs? I'm sorry. This Wednesday. Yes. So uh, Bud Canal's got lung, lung cancer surgery on Wednesday. Please keep that in prayer. That's Sheila and Candy's brother, for those who don't know that. What else can we be praying for? Cindy? Lord, we're so very, very thankful to be in your house today. And it kind of is illustrative as we walk in from the rain into a place that is dry. Uh, physically, that's what it is. But it should be a reminder that we have an opportunity to kind of, in a way, walk out of the world and come into this place so that we know your presence is here. And what a difference that is. So we thank you for that privilege. Thank you, Lord, that you love us enough to be here. I think we take that for granted. That you know, just because we call it a church and put a steeple on top, that you're automatically there. No, you, but you choose to be here. Especially in places like ours that we welcome you here. 
So thank you for that, God. And, and I know, Lord, that you already know about these things, but we want to lift them up to you. God, please, we pray for Bud this week, God, as he prepares to go for surgery. Lord, I lift up that surgeon. I pray, God, that, that you would be God in their hands from the beginning to the end. And I pray that everything that they, they are hoping to do, they'll be able to do with no problems, no complications. We begin to pray even now for his recovery. And I just want, we just want to lift Bud before you right now, Lord. Father, we also want to lift up John, John Tora, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your hand uh, in, in being with him and, and kind of forcing the hands of finally to get some, some care that he desperately needed. And thank you, Lord, that this progress and, and doing better, but we continue to lift him up. Lord, that, that he would continue to get better every day. And thank you, Lord, for your hand upon him. Please continue to be with him. Lord, we do pray for this family uh, that lost a uh, member on the motorcycle, God. I pray that you bring comfort to them. And uh, Lord, you are just an awesome, awesome God. Thank you so much for the opportunity for us to be with you today. And I pray, Lord, I do begin to pray for the new school year. Lord, that a year of learning. We pray, God, that your protection would be upon our schools. That kids would be able to learn. Lord, I pray that you would use teachers, especially those in our midst, in this church, and those who work in schools. God, please protect them but help them to have a great year, Lord. And I pray that you would use them as examples of, of you and your love. Lord, we leave the service right now at your feet, asking you to, to speak to each heart, to challenge us, Lord, to comfort us, to encourage us. We love you, Lord, and we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Scripture reading for the morning is found in the book of Luke. We'll be reading Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross to follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't you first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask him for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you have not, you have, you cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. You've got to have a blessing to the reading of People once again join me up here. We uh, sing a couple of songs starting with Shine Jesus Shine for a familiar song. Thank you. 
Holy Spirit will be teaching. So let's just bow for a moment, and then I'll, uh, I'll lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. But Lord, in saying that, we must thank you for the whole word, not just for those things that, that we like to hear. Because Lord, I know that's, that wasn't always what you taught. There are some things that are difficult to hear. And I pray right now, Lord, that your spirit would be teaching us this morning these things. Help us to hear them in a new light and to hear them the way that you shared them with your disciples in that crowd that day. Thank you, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to begin by reading a list, and these are actual complaints that were turned into a ranger station at a wilderness camping facility. Number one, trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. Too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to get rid of the area of these pests. Please pave the trails. Chair lifts need to be in some places so that we can get to wonderful views without having to hike to them. The, the coyotes made too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. A small deer came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. Is there a way I can get reimbursed? Escalators would help on steep uphill sections. A McDonald's would be nice at the trailhead. And then too many rocks in the mountains. Now obviously these complaints came from people who do not really understand what it means to camp out in the wilderness. My guess is that they'd rather be glamping than camping, right? And what they were really looking for was something convenient and comfortable. Certainly not any kind of roughing it experience. Well, in much the same way, many people I think today do not understand what it means to be a real, genuine Christian. You see, there are too many that follow Jesus or claim to be a Christian, but they want to do it on their own terms, not his. See, these people, I think, do not comprehend the biblical definition of discipleship. And because of this ignorance, there are many who may consider themselves to be followers of Jesus, but who in reality are not. They may look like a follower of Jesus, but unfortunately it ends there. And these people may go to church, may even have a profession of faith, Faith. They may even read their Bibles and pray and even support the church with their giving. But according to the things that we read from Jesus in our scripture for this morning, they are not disciples of Jesus. Well, I think part of the problem is that some, they see salvation and discipleship as two very distinct things. And they would certainly choose salvation, which is a great start. But the discipleship thing, you know, it sounds a little bit too hard. But listen, discipleship is not some kind of second step in Christianity. One does not become a believer in Jesus and then, if he chooses, a disciple. No, you see, from the very beginning of salvation, discipleship in, is involved in what it means to be a Christian. It's the whole growth process. Well, I've titled this series of sermons, A Tough Act to Follow, because Jesus does teach some things that are difficult to hear, this morning's scripture being one of them. However, we should not 
and cannot ignore those parts of God's word that make us uncomfortable. Maybe you've heard it said that Jesus, about Jesus, that he came to comfort the afflicted. But he also came, I believe, to afflict the comfortable. When we get comfortable, we stagnate. We are not as careful as we should be. And we aren't as willing to work at something. So let's, let's look at what Jesus has to say this morning. And keep in mind that, that as he's saying these things, he's in the last months of his earthly ministry. And we begin hearing about the large crowds that are following him. And in this crowd, as you can guess, there are probably many different reasons for them being there with him. I'm sure some of them were sincere, and they were hoping to be among his disciples. Others were definitely there just to see the miracles he performed, right? The show. It was the place to be, they thought. Others maybe followed him for some kind of selfish reason of, of earning a, some kind of special place of honor in the new kingdom that he, he was about to set up. Sounds like a couple of the disciples, right? They wanted to sit one on the right and one on his left. And there are probably many among this crowd who expected Jesus to try to recruit them with a speech like this. If anyone will come after me, he will have wealth and honor and the best of everything. Well, I'm sure they were very shocked when Jesus assured them of quite the opposite. He knew their hearts. And he knew that many of these people would prove to be a hindrance rather than a help to his ministry. So he decided to kind of separate the disciples from the glory seekers and the spectators. And as we just read, Jesus didn't paint them a very rosy picture of discipleship. He simply outlined to them the basic qualifications for the job. And friends, the truth is that in our churches, there are people who have made decisions about following Jesus without fully realizing or counting the cost. And as a result, sometimes their efforts are in vain. And they end up, unfortunately, leaving the faith. And sometimes they even become bitter towards God because things didn't turn out like they thought they did. And by the way, this is nothing new. Near the end of his ministry on earth, Jesus found himself surrounded by many people who, who needed to maybe reevaluate their reason and their decision to follow. So let's look at the first couple of verses, 25 and 27. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Well, it's important to let you know that these qualifications that Jesus gives for discipleship, these are still uh, required today. So let's take a closer look at them. But we hear a phrase in this passage that is also the title of my message, right? Cannot be my disciple. And the word cannot we find it three different times in the scripture, verses 26, 27, and 33. And Jesus is telling the crowd that those who do not come after him with this certain level of commitment cannot be his disciples. Well, the word cannot is a, is a compound word in the Greek. It's the words O-U-K and the other words D-U-N-A-M-A-I. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. But the Greek word ok, I guess, means that means not, and the word dunami means power or ability. So in other words, Jesus is saying that those who try to come after him with less than total commitment, listen, do not have the power or ability to become his followers or his disciples. And this is difficult for us to grasp here, right? We might remember verses like, in, first, in John chapter 1, where he says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And, and the word right here is a word in the Greek that literally means authority. So the authority to become a child, a follower, a disciple of God is granted to those who receive him and believe in his name. That's where it says here, yet... 
those who come with less than total commitment do not have the ability or power to be his disciples. Therefore, it seems that, that God is saying to us that we cannot receive him or believe in his name if we are unwilling to come to him in total commitment. And I know that those are difficult words for us to hear. They're uncomfortable. But look, listen, first of all, understand that these words from Jesus do not change who he is. His love for us never changes. He has made it possible for each of us to come to him. But as we can see from the teaching here, how we come to him is very, very important. So let's be, begin here with this first requirement of discipleship. Here, verse 26. It says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yet, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So we hear these words and we say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Did I read that correctly? And maybe we read it two or three times. Did Jesus just tell me? That if I wanted to follow him, that, that I had to hate those who were closest to me? This seemed to be the complete opposite of what we know about God and his character. Right after all, the Bible tells us that God is love. And Jesus has told us in other places that we must love one another. In fact, the Bible teaches that people will know that we are the children of God by the way we love each other. Yet... Here we have Jesus telling us, or seemingly telling us, that we must hate in order to follow him. And then it might become even more confusing, confusing as we look at another passage from Matthew. That's what he says here. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies would be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And again, we read that with confused looks on our faces. We say, well, wait a minute, how can this be? What does he mean that we're not worthy of him? if we don't hate those who should be some of our closest relationships. Well, first of all, we, we must understand that the Bible here is not contradic contradicting itself. We must realize that these statements represent this kind of comparative idea. Yes, God is love. Yes, we are called to love one another. Jesus himself would go on to give us what he called the first and greatest commandment, right? In Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. <clears throat> but he's telling this crowd of potential disciples that if they love anyone or anything more than they love him, even their own life, then they cannot be his disciples. Now notice that Jesus didn't say should not or would not, but he said very plainly that they could not be his disciples. You see, from the very beginning of Christianity on, countless people who would have followed Jesus and formed a saving relationship with him have been discouraged and even forbidden by the very ones closest to them. Listen, I actually came across a story of one man who had converted to Christianity from Judaism. And when he told his parents, they disowned him. And taking a step further, they actually had a funeral for him. See, in their eyes, he had died. He was out of the family. He had become a non-person for his faith. See, Jesus is telling us that if you come after him, if you want to be a follower of him, listen, you must love him more than anything or anybody in the universe. For example, if someone asked you to rate your love for your wife or your husband on a scale of 1 to 10, you would probably say 10, right? Especially if they were present. If someone were to ask you to rate your love for a children again, you'd probably say 10. 
However, according to Jesus' statement in these passages, if you're going to follow him, if someone asked you to rate your love for him on the same scale as your wife and children, you would have to say one million and ten. Because there, there is no comparison, or, or there should be no comparison. In other words, our love for him, compared to our love for our family and friends, should be so much greater that it appears by comparison that we hate everybody else and love him. And quite frankly, we cannot love anyone else as we should unless we have a passionate love for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love for God must be the first requirement for discipleship. Now, consider with me the Secret Service of the United States without thinking about recent events. Generally, it is their job to protect the president at all costs, right? They are trained to jump in front of the bullet intended for the man they're protecting. If Jesus were the president and they died to protect him, would that qualify them for discipleship? Believe it or not, the answer is no. Because the Secret Service doesn't take a bullet for the president because they love him. Right? They do it. Why? Because it's their job. See, the problem is that sometimes Christians serve the Lord out of a sense of duty or obligation. And that does not fulfill this first requirement of discipleship. Listen, we need to be serving the Lord out of our love for him. And you need to know there's a distinct difference here. Well, Jesus not only tells us that we are not to love any person more than him, he also tells us not to love anything more than him. Recently, in our fireside Bible studies, we looked at the story of the rich young ruler. And remember, he came to Jesus asking what he must do to receive eternal life. And Jesus, seeing that he held all this wealth and it was, it was more important than anything else, he told him to go and sell all of those possessions and then give the money to the poor and then come follow him. And we, we are told that the young man went away sad. But you see, this, this man did consider the cost. And unfortunately, he did not consider it at that time to be cost effective. See, even if he had sold all his possessions grudgingly and followed Jesus, but still longed for all that treasure that he once had, his heart would have eventually become bitter and resentful, leaving him possibly spiritually worse off than he was before. And then we see the second qualification of discipleship. Look at verse 27. Anyone who does not carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now in the Roman world, we know that crucifixion was one of the most popular forms of capital punishment in those days. And part of that punishment was, it, was administered after the, the whipping or the flogging and before they reached the site of the crucifixion. You see, as was the case with Jesus, the prisoner was forced to carry his cross, or at least part of it, all the way to the crucifixion site. And along the way, lined up and down the streets, was a multitude of onlookers laughing and, and mocking and cursing and spitting and even possibly throwing rocks at the condemned. And the cross was an unmistakable symbol of shame and reproach that, that, that caused attention to this unfortunate soul who was called to bear it, making him this easily identifiable target of their aggression. You see, not only does bearing our cross mean that we're willing to die for our Savior, it means that we're not ashamed of or afraid of the consequences of following him down those dusty streets of humiliation and persecution with our crosses on our backs, shouting, I'm with him. You see, Jesus is saying this to get the crowds to, to think through their enthusiasm to him. He encouraged those who were superficial either to go deeper or to turn back. 
You see, following Christ means total submission to him. Maybe even to the death. <clears throat> and, and praise God for his mercy, by the way, when we don't boldly and even proudly carry that cross. Self-preservation at all costs seem to be, be, seems to be one of the hardest natural instincts to overcome. But again, it must be be laid on the altar of sacrifice if we are to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. And we all know that, that, that most of those first disciples did, in fact, pay the ultimate price for their affiliation with the Lord. But they were only the first of many more to come who would count the cost of following Jesus and then deem it well worth the price. You see, carrying the cross is dedicating yourself to the Lord now and forever. And in the words of Paul in Romans 12, it's when you determine that you would not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve of God's will as his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then lastly is this idea of counting the cost. It was a best-selling book in the Christian ranks a few years ago they have in my library. It's called Not a Fan. Fans, we know, can be fitting, right? When things are going good for the team, we, we fill the stands and we cheer them on. <clears throat> but when the chips are down, what do we do? We criticize every decision, every play. We badmouth the players and the coach. And they, they feed on the excitement and then vanish when the difficult times come. The sad truth is that many Christians can as resemble football fans, right? They, they rally around the excitement, then kind of disappear from the work. They encourage in the good times, and then they criticize when things aren't going so well. They fill the pew and wait to be entertained. And Jesus understood this. We, we find him in our scripture basically saying to the crowd, listen, I'm not looking for fans. I'm looking for followers. Here's the danger. Jesus wanted the crowd to count the cost of discipleship. And he used these two illustrations of it in our text, right? It's important that those who would come to be followers of Christ understand the level of, of commitment that's required of them lest they enter only as a fan and fool themselves into thinking that they're followers. And how blinded sometimes people in our pews, Sunday after Sunday, thinking that they're followers of Christ when their level of commitment reveals that really they're nothing more than fans of Jesus. And how dangerous is this state of mind when you, when you think you're, you're eternally ready only to find out that then you come up short because you're not willing to forsake all to follow him. Jesus tells a story about, about a builder building a tower. And when such a builder doesn't count the cost or estimate it inaccurately, his building may be left half completed. <clears throat> and the thought is this. Friends, will your life be only half built and then abandoned because you did not count the cost of commitment to Jesus. You know, we, we may have been stared at, talked about because of our faith. Some may even have lost a job or, or a close relationship because of our faith. But believe me when I tell you, we don't know what it's really like to be persecuted. In fact, in this country, we've, we've had a made in that respect for a long time. But I believe the Bible is clear that there will be a time when we will face persecution. When that real persecution comes with, with real laws and real punishments. Will, will you ditch your cross and try to blend in with the crowd? Or will you continually continue to shamelessly follow the Lord with your own cross, basically saying, hey, I'm with him. Remember what Jesus told us, by the way? What did he say? In this world, you will have trouble. Becoming a Christian does not guarantee us a life of ease 
and roses as many people mistakenly believe. No, sometimes the sign to follow the Lord brings an element of chaos into our lives. But to the true follower of Jesus, these trials and persecutions are nothing, nothing compared to the inner and eternal peace that he places down deep inside of every one of his disciples. The sad reality is that time is coming when some will realize that they're not willing to pay the cost of following Jesus. And the reason that they will be unwilling will be because they don't truly know him. This is why I think Satan loves to, to cultivate casual Christians, right? Who, who are people who, who try to stay just close enough to the Lord when, when, when they think they're saved, but yet far enough not to be too closely associated to be inconvenienced or singled out. My friends, I pray that you, all of us, won't be caught in that category, but rather side with Paul when he says words like this in Philippians 3. But whatever it was to my prophet, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss <clears throat> compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake, listen, I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. If we could even begin to comprehend the depth of love that God has for us, if we could just catch a glimpse of the pain and the suffering that Jesus endured on our behalf because of that love, I think, we would be much more inclined to love him back. Paul says in Romans 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. To the real sense of love, that Jesus ends this passage by saying this in verses 34 and 35. He says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It's thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus is kind of leaving this crowd with a warning. And it's this. When something loses what it was made for, it becomes useless. Salt is used as a, a preservative and, and, and for flavoring. And when it's doing neither of those things, it's useless. Jesus wants his followers, his disciples, to be examples to the world. He wants them to be sharing about his love. But listen, <clears throat> when a Christian blends in totally with the world and acts just like the world, as a Christian, at that point, they too are useless. And Jesus ends this passage by saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's another way of him saying, listen up, pay attention, this is important. He wants them to understand what he's saying here. He wants them to listen with their physical ears, yes, but along with their spiritual ears. Now listen I know that some of these things are difficult to hear. We, we like to be comfortable, right? But that's kind of the point of this series of messages. Jesus does say some difficult things, and we can't ignore them. And we need to hear them, I believe. In closing, as we prayerfully consider the cost of discipleship, let us also consider the penalty for sin. The cost of redemption and who paid it for us and why. And may we, along with all the martyred saints of yesterday and today, consider that cost of discipleship and come to find out that, you know what, it really is a bargain. Because the things that we gain from being a follower and disciple of Jesus are 
more than any suffering or hardship we might face because of it. So Lord, thank you so much for your word. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your teachings. And for never, never watering down the message. And Lord, I know that's because of your love. Because you don't want us comfortable. Comfortable to the point where we never want to move. You know all things. You know what you create us for. And how you want to use us. And I know it grieves you. When we are just comfortable sitting in the pews. So Lord, again, I ask that you, your Holy Spirit, would continue to teach these difficult things. And help us, yes, to hear it with our ears. But Lord, help us to take it and really listen to what you're saying in our hearts. Because you say it with love. You say it because you want the very best for us, I believe. So thank you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. The worship team comes up, comes up. We're going to sing, a, I think, an appropriate hymn, number 498, More About Jesus. Let's stand again. so much for this day, this time in your house. And Lord, we, as we sing that song, it's so true, more about you. We need to have more of you. And the more, I believe, the more we learn about you, the more we are going to love you. And I'm so thankful, God, that the things that you call us to do, you've already done. You're asking us to give ourselves to you. When in reality, you gave your life for us. Thank you, Lord, for that example. And I pray that you would go with us right now, Lord, that you uh, grant us peace as we, as we travel and tour together again, Lord. Again, we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.